multiplied ministry there, uh, the uh, doctrinal uh, teaching ministry, which they're involved in. And so Brad's going to come and uh, give us an update on all of that. So we've been looking forward to that. Uh, I heard that uh, Miss Sarah Martinez took a spill today. She fell down the steps in the garage or something like that. She She's in the hospital for some tests. They don't know if they're going to keep her yet or not. That was the last thing I heard from Harry a while ago. So said she may be dehydrated. Yeah, yeah, that was mentioned that she may be dehydrated. So, but that's all I know. Did you hear from her? That's all I did. But that's good, all I heard. Good. Okay. Well, if you know anything else, you just tell it. All right. Good. All right, Brad. Why don't you just come on up and sure. get us started? Thank you. It's good to be back with all of you tonight. Thank you for um, having me back to see you again. Um, turn with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 16. Matthew, y'all know, let's see, I've got to find these glasses now. It's that time. It is that time. So Matthew, I think that's where I want to go. Thank you, thank you. Paige, you are older than I am. Paige is older than I am. We'll just repeat that yet again for the take. So uh, turn to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And it says this, this is um, Jesus speaking, of course, to the apostles in, in verse 15. And he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Christ has been about building his church for a little over 2,000 years now. Beginning in Acts chapter 2, of course, is the beginning of what we call the church age. And Christ has been about building that church. Revelation 5 tells us that this church is going to be made of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Which is kind of exciting to me uh, to hear it's every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Over the course of human history, there have been many tribes and many tongues and many nations. And even in our world today, there are many tribes and tongues and nations that will all sing in one accord about blessed is he who was and who is and is to come. And worthy is the lamb who was slain that was given for the sacrifice for you and for me. And so Christ is about building his church. And of course, for a church, he needs a body, right? Just like you need a body to do work, right? You have a body which does work at your house or at your job or whatever that may be. You need a body within which to work to do the task, the missions that are before you, well, Christ himself needs a body. And the body that he is forming is what you and I make up, and we are the church, and we are the body. We are the hands, we are the feet, we're the eyes, we're the ears. We are his instrument to be used, and I always just call myself the, the loud mouth. It seems to work pretty well, right? The, the old loud mouth. But we are all to be his instrument. And that we all have a mission, we all have a ministry as part of who we are. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us that within the church that he gave some to be apostles, and he gave some to be pastor teachers, he gave some to be evangelists, and he lists out the spiritual gifts. And the church is for uh, edifying you and building you up personally, and then it's for sending you out. We're all sent out. We all have a ministry, and we all have a mission. And of course, that is the purpose of the church, is to build you up and to send you out. And, of course, that is the purpose of what we have today, of course, in the church. And part of the church's function is to send people out. And so at this point, this is where I say thank you for Albany Bible Church for your prayers and your support for helping send DM2 out and sending me out uh, for this particular mission trip for Zambia. Thank you for those who have supported us financially for this trip and other trips. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Zambia tonight and, and what I found in Zambia and kind of cross-reference it to other things that DM2 is doing. But uh, DM2 is not only in Zambia. You all know this. We work in Bolivia. We work in 
uh, Sierra Leone, we work in Liberia, we have uh, conferences, workshops in, in uh, Venezuela and Brazil. Um, all of those uh, really kind of all over the world where the workshops continue to go. Um, most of them are virtual during 2020. We all just erase 2020. Isn't that what we do now? We don't count it as a year. Um, but nevertheless, that, that the work continues. We've been continuing to work virtually um, around the world. DM2 is starting something new called uh, 3D in which they are taking young, uh, young people. I see a few young people here tonight. Young people that are in, interested in the ministry. Um, and sometimes they take that year off of college before, or year off from high school before they go to college and training young men and women uh, in the Bible, training them in uh, being missionaries, if that's something that they're interested in doing, uh, and they're working on that uh, presently. So uh, as we talk about that, I just want to talk about what we did with Zambia, and some of you received emails and, and were forwarded, which is, is cer certainly fine in, in, in this field in Zambia, but uh, I, I titled a lot of my emails with, with writing with Rex. Um, so you see here, here's a picture of Rex, and this is a picture of me riding with Rex. So Rex was my driver for, uh, mine and Brett's driver for the week. So it was only Brett Nasworth and I. Brett's the director of DM2. Uh, we went to Zambia um, the first part of May. Um, we were there actually about two weeks um, due to COVID and COVID testing. Um, but nevertheless, um, that's where we were. And our driver for the entire time was this young man here named Rex Banda. And Rex, um, I mean, picks us up at the airport, and I think most of you know, about two minutes after I leave the airport, yes, the district attorney, yes, gets pulled over by the police. So we had already asked on the way, we're in an SUV, do we need to put on seat belts? Do we not need to put on seat belts? What would you like for us to do? And he said, no problem, no worries, don't put it on. So we didn't put on seat belts. We had luggage everywhere in the car because we took all the books from America over there. So we took 150 workbooks for DM2 and boxes over there. Brett had five pieces of luggage, and I had two. And so we were all shoved in this little SUV. Um, and so we just decided not to, um, not to put on seatbelts. And, of course, two minutes later, as we're leaving the airport, we get pulled over by the police. And Brett decides we're going to jail. Brett says, I want to go to jail. And I'm like, Wait, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to go to jail. This is not what I want to do with this situation. But they were going to charge us some exorbitant amount of money for a fine for not wearing seat belts. I think it was somewhere around uh, 300 a piece or something like that for a seat belt fine. Of course, it's $14 here in the United States a piece uh, for people not wearing seat belts, just so you know. Uh, but nevertheless... <laughs> They were going to charge us some money, and Brett said, no, take us to the jail. We want to talk to your supervisor and all of this, and it became a huge ordeal, and I think, I'm going to go to a Zambian jail. Come all the way over here to go to jail, and that's not what I had intended for, uh, for my life and, and how I saw my life ending in a Zambian jail, and then I wanted to think about, uh, I, mean, I, I don't sing as well as Paul and Silas, I know this, but, you know, we're Maybe we need, just need to practice. Maybe that's what we need to do about singing and ministry in the, in the Zambian jail. I said, Lord, that's, you know, I know Paul, you know, had to go to prison and, and ministry, had a prison ministry. I don't really want that prison ministry. I, that's not what I wanted for this. But we wondered about that. But this is Rex. And so um, I spent a lot of time with Rex um, uh, in the two days prior. Brett had a lot of work to do at the hotel. Um, and so I said, well, I really don't want to sit in my room at the hotel. I'm in Zambia. So I went riding with Rex. Um, that's what I called it for a couple of days before we would even go to our workshop. And so I went riding with Rex. Had a lot of good conversations with Rex. Um, he, he, is, he was acquainted with church, acquainted with, with those types of things, um, and probably professed to be a believer at that point. I don't know for sure that he was. Um, that said... <laughs> traveled the next day we had a 12 once we got to um so we flew into lasaka lasaka is the let me back that up sorry so zambia is i don't have a pointer here but this is zambia here and so we flew into lasaka that is here is down in the south uh, the southern part of the country and then we had a once we got into zambia just for the plane flights just so you know can it's about a 24-hour plane flight so that just kind of lets you know and then that's combining and layovers and all that but nevertheless we then had a 12-hour SUV ride to Kasama, which is in the north part of the country. Up near, you see the border of Congo, um, let's see, Tanzania, and Malawi. So we, we had a 12-hour 
um, ride there. Um, and so that all that time is with Rex. And so Brett and I practiced our Paul and Silas singing because I thought we probably would be in jail at some point. We need to go ahead and get this ministry down, our singing ministry down. Um, needless to say, no one will be hiring us out, Ken, so you don't have any competition. Um, with that, we, we, you know, we started talking with Rex. I mean, that was kind of the, the main thing um, uh, that we did. Um, and Brett just gave Rex the gospel um, just as clear as it could have ever been given. Um, and Rex, you could tell, was contemplating everything he had heard. Um, don't know at that point what he believed or if he believed or anything like that. And um, he just sat there and, and kind of, you know, kind of took it all in. And I'll update you on Rex. By the end of the week, I, I have pretty much no doubt that he became a believer on the week's end. Um, just a, an amazing uh, time. Uh, Rex now has my Bible. I don't even have my Bible anymore. Um, Rex has it. And um, he got all of my Hebrews books, so I don't have any of those anymore. But, I, you know, I can get more, so no big deal. Um, on the 12-hour ride, this is just some of the scenery we saw. Um, a lot of my pictures would not upload today for some reason. It's been one of those days that nothing wants to work. But um, this is coal, and so many of the men and women, this is how they make their living. Um, they live out in the countryside, and they go into the mountains or the cliffs, and they go and dig out coal for themselves. And they bring it, and they put it on the road, and trucks come by and pick up the coal, and they get paid for the loads of coal that they put out on the side of the road. So... I just thought that was astoundingly interesting, so I took a picture of it and to bring it to show to you. Lots of those what you'd call open-air fresh markets everywhere. Everybody sold tomatoes and watermelons, and I don't know how anybody ever made anything because there were so many out there to buy, but just fresh markets everywhere with, with goods along the road. Humanity, just a sea of humanity everywhere. Um, walking, riding bikes, cars, all of those things just on this 12-hour ride. But it was um, something, uh, certainly a sight to see. So this was my first trip to Zambia. Y'all know that my ministry has been in Myanmar since 2014. I've been going to Myanmar every year, twice a year. Um, so Zambia this year, I was the only one that said, yes, I'll go. Everyone else said, no, we are not going anywhere this year. That usually goes to Zambia. And so Brett, um, Brett came to my mom's funeral and just said, hey, Brad, I'm going to Zambia. Would you like to go to Zambia with us? And I said, absolutely, sure. So uh, let's go. So Brett and I were the only two. Um, there's usually a normal team that goes to Zambia. I am not on that team, but because no one else could go or would go, uh, this time, uh, I, I went with Brett on this trip to Zambia. Brett's been, I think, every time. So they've been actually going to Zambia for, I guess, eight years. Do you count 2020? So seven if you don't count 2020, but eight years if you count it. Um, and they usually do two workshops a year. Um, but I think they've done three one year. They did a Women of the Word workshop where um, we took a lot of the ladies that worked with DM2 and taught the workshop um, to a ladies group. And so this is probably the, I think we finally decided it was either the 14th or the 15th trip to Zambia that they've been working with the same group of men and women. Um, and so they are not new to who we are and our ministry and what we do with, with teaching the word from a, a doctrinal um, standpoint. Um, so they, they are familiar with that. Um, Brett told me at one time, and so I'm just, I'm just repeating what somebody told me. It almost seems unbelievable. So I'm just repeating that, but it, about 50 different denominations um, present within what we do. Now, this time I asked specifically, we had Catholics, we had Seventh-day Adventists. Um, this church itself is a Pentecostal type church, a charismatic type church, and then Assemblies of God um, churches as well. I don't remember any Baptist or Methodist, um, anything like that, but um, probably most every denomination you would imagine was represented at the workshop. Um, so the, the, this is the actual um, sign from the church that we worked in, which is called Christian Mission Fellowship International that they've worked in. They've worked in this same church for about eight years. In fact, the pastor of this church um, died about six months ago from COVID. At least that's what we understood. Um, and they're still awaiting getting a new pastor, but they have been hosting DM2 for about eight years um, in this Pentecostal church. Now, uh, that's just completely amazing to me. I worked in churches of Church of Christ and worked in other denominations. Never been in a, in a, a charismatic type denomination, um, but this is where we were um, for this particular thing. This sign, so I know it's the, the writing is not there, um, but you can read probably very well. 
Um, but it says, Christian Mission Fellowship exists to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to proclaim his gospel, to train and encourage believers to develop a loving and caring relationship amongst themselves, and to put world mission as a priority. And so um, that is the, the church we were working in, um, that they have worked in uh, for um, that many years. So this is the church, the inside of the church. And no, it's not a great picture, but I'm set, I sit over to the side every day, so where these flowers are in the foreground of the picture there, I'm sitting over there every day, kind of away from everybody else, because we had to do COVID regulations. Yes, I had to wear a mask um, the whole time we were there. And the funny, you can't see it probably in the photograph, but they all have DM2 masks. Who would have thunk it, right? <laughs> so we get there, and they all have these DM2 masks on. They've got DM2 shirts on. And I'm like, I was like, Brett, do we make DM2 masks? I mean, is that a thing? I want one, right? And um, But anyway, we, I did not get one, um, but I, I did want one. But we... So this is the church we taught in. The church actually, in every workshop except for this one, um, they've had over 200 people at every one of the workshops um, in Zambia. So this particular workshop, the government limits us to 150 people, and we had, I, I know over 100, I stopped counting every day at 100 just to just kind of get an idea of who all was there and the numbers of people that were there. Um, some days, 120, I'd stop counting, but I know that we gave out 150 workbooks. So over the course of the, the week-long workshop, 150 people were there, um, and we purposely gave the gospel, of course, each of those days for uh, the case of, of those coming in that had not been there previously. Um, this is a picture of me up teaching there. That's me up front. Um, so over the, the, so the five days, we taught for 30 hours total. Um, that's almost a full-time job, right? So 30 hours total um, that we taught over the five days. There was one day that we had a funeral at the church. We were told it wasn't going to last but an hour or two, and it lasted the entire morning. So we were not able to teach but about two or three hours that day. We made those days up the following days, and they would come seven and a half hours for some of the teaching on those days. Now, in Myanmar, we, I've already told you this before, so I don't want you thinking this worked like that because nothing worked like Myanmar. Um, it, comparatively, um, we would take breaks every hour, you know, pretty much, and let the people have a short break a longer lunch break, and then go into the afternoon. The Zambians, they don't know what breaks are. I needed a break, but they did not need a break. And so we would start generally 8.30 every morning, and we would go until the lunch came in. Brett, my order from Brett was, you teach until the lunch is ready. Well, some days that was going to be 2. So we would teach from 8.30 until 2 in the afternoon. Some days that would be 2.30. Some days that would be 3. I just never knew... But my orders were to teach straight. We never took a break. We never said, okay, we're going to break for five minutes or ten minutes. It was straight through teaching 8.30. To, if you had to go use the facilities, then you got up and used the facilities. And these Zambians, they don't, they don't use the facilities. It, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it just wasn't an issue. I, I mean, I, I say that jokingly, but it just it, it didn't seem to be an issue and um, all of that. So we the, the language, my pictures would not upload, so I was going to show you all a picture of... Um, the language is called Bimba. Um, that is, there's, there's several languages within the country of Zambia. The people that uh, are in this area primarily speak Bimba. Bimba was one of the main tribes, and there's a forgotten other language that's predominant in Lusaka and the other area. But nin non ninja, nanja, it almost sounds like ninja. It's not ninja, but, you know, go with that. Just say that. That sounds good. It's easy to say. But nanja or something like that. But anyway, um, we, we taught in, um, I taught in English. Yes, and um, they translated into Bimba. We had two translators that we worked with, and I, I know that y'all love to hear this from me, so that's why I always tell it. It's, it's very self-deprecating for me. I, I had not taught with a translator for a year and a half because I hadn't been to Myanmar. And so when I got up to just start teaching the first day, the book of Hebrews is about Y'all know how I do, right? I mean, y'all know me. The translator has no, I mean, has no joking in his body or anything. He, he is completely, he, he just looked at me. <laughs> great, great fun. And I said, and I looked at him and went, what, what, what? <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. And we, we had to start all over and start again. And then the other translator, when he started with me, he just looks at me and laughs. <laughs> he just laughs. So I had to apologize. They, those guys had the hardest jobs for those five days uh, of anybody there and um, just did a tremendous job once I slowed down and uh, remembered how to teach with a translator. But um, 
so the different countries, so we had about four different countries represented. So, of course, um, Zambia was represented. So back on that map that was on that first slide, um, those countries that border Zambia to the north, um, we had people there from Congo. Um, we had people there. So Congo is the, the brown country here. Um, we had people from Malawi, which is here. Zambia is here. Um, and then also from, uh, lost it, Tan Tanzania, here. So people would travel um, to uh, Kasama from those countries and come down for the conference. Um, I spoke with the man from Congo and the man from Malawi. Um, and this was their first workshop, their first experience with this type of teaching. And they were overwhelmed. Um, just extremely appreciative and overwhelmed with the teaching and could not believe that people teach like this. Um, it was just something foreign to their existence, and so they um, were just amazed by it and just couldn't get enough. And they said, can you come to Congo? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> not coming to the Congo anytime soon. So um, with, with, uh, but I will, you know I will. Uh, that said, um, that's the countries that, we, that I know were represented. Just another overall shot of um, the people there. Um, a lot of the ladies sat in the back. Um, a lot of the men on the front row were pastors and leaders in the local churches. So one of the main things that DM2 does is our goal is to train already established pastors and leaders within local churches to teach them the information so that they go back into their churches and teach others. That's, that's one of the main goals and main purposes. Um, most of the men there um, were of, of that ilk. They were pastors, teachers, or leaders within their local churches. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give you kind of another overall shot um, from that. So this is our contact there. This is uh, Joseph Charma. Joseph and I met, I think, I met Joseph a long time ago, probably 2000. I met, I started working with DM2 in 2012. Gosh, that's nine years. Paige, we're old. So, so w with that, um, so about, you know, nine years ago, um, I met Joseph. Joseph actually came to the United States. Um, he was at Clay Ward's church up in, in Tennessee, and I met Joseph there a long time ago. And um, I'd, I'd forgotten, but he reminded me that I'd promised him I was coming to Zambia. I, I didn't remember this promise that I'd made, but I, I don't doubt I made it. Um, and he says, you're finally here. So I, I made it. But Joseph has been our contact there for a long time. Um, Joseph is just a tremendous leader within his community, within, his ch within the, the local group of churches that come together. And so he's our contact there that we deal with um, routinely and just a, just a tremendous man of, a man of faith. Um, this was my little buddy for the trip. Y'all know, I'm going to tell y'all this, but you know, this is not for you to make this my new moniker. But my moniker while I was there was Bishop Brad for the children. So um, anyway... You know, that's what happens. But this, is, this was my buddy for the trip. This is Sapo. Um, and Sapo means hope in the Bimba language. And so this was little hope. Um, but uh, this was uh, actually Pastor Zimba. So Pastor Zimba is another one of the pastors there. And this is Pastor Zimba's grandchild. And so everywhere Pastor Zimba went, Sapo went. And, of course, Sapo and I were big buddies and hung out pretty much all week. And he definitely likes uh, Starburst and Skittles because I <laughs> kept him fed. So... I call that my tablecloth. <laughs> um, uh, that was one of the gifts that, that I was given for teaching. You're going to see another one in the video. I was going to wear it tonight, but I don't know. I, I just I actually I ran out of time and didn't have a chance to, to get changed between work and, and getting here. So, um, so you did not get the, the outfit, but that is my favorite shirt now. So um, it, it's, it's cool. It feels like a, I'm wearing a, a tablecloth. I asked Brett, I said, what is this? I said, is this real leather? What is this? He says, no, tablecloth. So I <laughs> call it my tablecloth church. So we did the workshop. So the workshop, again, lasted 30 hours or so of teaching uh, through the book of Hebrews. We did chapters 1 through 7. So Hebrews, of course, has, I think, 16 chapters. I think I'm right saying that. I didn't check that before I said that. But I think that's right. Somewhere close to that. Just take it and run with it. So we split it up in half. Um, to teach one half now, we will return. DM2 will return. I don't know that I will, but DM2 will return and teach the remainder uh, on the next trip, likely in the fall of this year, um, you know, COVID restrictions and whatever, you know, um, being part of that. But um, so that is, that is what we did and what we taught over that week. 
So we traveled back, um, that 12-hour um, SUV ride. I meant to tell you all about these potholes. Y'all, y'all think you know what potholes are here in America? You don't know anything about a pothole. There was a pothole as big as the SUV. And if you went in the pothole, you were going to die. I mean, that was, that's what was going to happen. And, we, and you have two lanes of traffic, and the pothole's bigger than the two lanes of traffic, so everybody's trying to dodge the pothole at the same time as you're going 50 miles an hour. And so it, it's, it's quite a comedy of errors. And so my resolution to trusting the Lord and the faith that I'm going to get there is just going to sleep. That was my resolution as I was slung all over the car dodging potholes. But um, the potholes there were just unbelievably large, and there would be like a big one here and a big one there and a big one, I mean, everywhere. I mean, you're just, it's just like an obstacle course trying to dodge potholes. And I must tell you one other funny story um, because it's just typical of me in my life. So one night after the workshop, this is just a funny aside, um, I wanted to go get a Diet Coke, yes, I know, at the store. And so I wanted to go into town. I didn't want to walk, so I asked Rex to take me to the store in the SUV. Um, And they also have crunchies there, Paige. Oh, my gosh, crunchies, my favorite thing. They don't sell them here, but anyway. um, They had crunchies at the store in Zambia, and I wanted to go get a crunchy. So, and a Diet Coke. So we drove to, you must order one, you must have it. They are divine. They are, they are, I did, I I ate them all on the way back. I really... (laughs) I, br- I told a friend when I was there that they have crunchies here. She said, bring me a whole bunch back. And so I bought a whole bunch to bring back for her, and guess how many made it back? Not one. <laughs> I, I can't explain it. But I really can, but let's, let's not. So, when we, so I went to the store, and so we, we pull up to their, I don't know, it wouldn't really be a Walmart, but like their, their grocery store, sim- similar situation. It's not as big as Walmart, but it's their Walmart uh, in the middle of town. Everybody everywhere, people everywhere. And so we pull up to this parking space at the front of the store. And this group of young guys, probably early 20s, I'm guessing, just start yelling and screaming at me and Rex as we're in the car. And they're just yelling and screaming. And Bimba, of course, I don't understand a word of it. All I understand is somebody is angry at me. That's what I understand. And I don't need to be where I'm at getting crunchies and a Diet Coke. I'm like, Rex, we can, I can go back to the hotel. The crunchy is not worth this. He says, no, get out. I'm like, I'm not getting out. <laughs> I will stay right here. That's what I will do. I'm good. I'm good. It's not that big of a deal. He says, get out. And I'm like, okay. So, so I get out, and these guys are just a yelling and a yelling at him. And I just said, well, okay, I'm just, I'm just going in the store. So I, I just quickly moved into the store. Rex, I said, Rex, what's going on? He's, he wouldn't tell me. So anyway, I go shopping for what felt like an eternity shopping. I don't do shopping well, but I was in there shopping, and finally Rex comes and gets me, because I didn't want to go out, right? So Rex comes and gets me finally and says, are you ready to go? I'm like, well, yeah. So w- w- he comes and gets me, and, he, and I said, what is the problem? What is going on out there? Why are these guys so angry at you, at me, or both of us, or what's going on? And he said, well, um, they were mad at me about the tire." that I had on the car. I was like, well, why are they going to be mad about a tire? Well, he says, because it's threadbare, and it's amazing you didn't have a blowout. And we all didn't die on the road with the big potholes. And I said, oh, okay, good to know. I said, what are we doing about this tire? He says, well, I've taken it to the tire shop. And I said, well, what are we going to do now? And he says, well, we can walk to the tire shop. So we walk to the tire shop. And I get to the tire shop, and the tire shop is also located by the coffin shop. So while they're fixing the tire, I just look at coffins. (laughs) You must. This is what you do, is you look at coffins. And you pick out a coffin, and you figure out which one's the best, right? So I had some young guy explain to me how to make a coffin. So if you need to make a coffin, I'm your guy. So I learned all about coffins that afternoon and how they make them in Zambia, which was a great, it really was a great experience. It's one that only happens to me um, as we go to the coffin shop. Not coffee shop, thank you, the coffin shop. So as we left, um, Lusaka left the workshop, we went down to, um, uh, back to Lusaka. Lusaka is the capital city, big capital city, uh, a lot of modern things there, but it's also obviously third world. 
Kasama was obviously third world, not really much modern there. Um, just old, old, old buildings, old things. Everything was, was what it was probably 30, 40 years ago. Um, so Pastor Obed was one of the uh, pastors that has been to every workshop. Pastor Obed has been going to all the workshops. He makes the long travel by car up there. In fact, um, his wife was coming to one of the workshops and was killed on the way in, in, a, in a motor car accident. He's now remarried, um, has, has a new wife. I met her at church. But he invited us to come and speak at his church um, on that Sunday. It, you don't think about taking your life in your hands every time you, you go somewhere, but you really do there on with, with traffic and, and um, everything else. But, I mean, Interstate 75 is no different. I mean, you're, you're taking your life in your hands. So, nevertheless, Pastor Obed, um, we went to his church on that Sunday, um, and Brett taught the class on Sunday morning. Um, and afterwards, after the teaching, um, they, Pastor Obed just gets up in front of everybody and says, y'all will come back tomorrow and y'all will teach us for four hours tomorrow. And we're like, what? <laughs> um, and, but that just shows you how, how appreciative he was and how much he thought it was necessary for his congregation to hear it. Um, Pastor Obed spoke um, at a couple, we had a couple of pastors, like my, my emails kind of um, stopped because every night after the workshop, after we've taught all day, the pastors wanted to come and meet with us at the hotel every night. They would want to have dinner, they want to meet, they want to talk, they want to have those discussions that we love to have. And so, of course, my free time went to nothing, um, and that's fine. That was what I, what I needed um, to, to do um, because that's what's important, that's what we're there for. And so anyway, Pastor Obed then asked us to come back and teach the next day, and Brett took about two hours, and I took about two hours, and we taught. Basically, we taught from in the beginning. We basically took them through the entire Bible from the beginning to the end um, with Christ as the focus, and um, it's, a, it's a great little message and a great little way to do it, but it was just, it was fantastic. Uh, fantastically delivered, Holy Spirit just, just kind of worked, and um, it was just an amazing event. Um, Pastor Obed, um, this is, just, you know, I, they don't write out things like, the Myanmar people do for me, the Burmese people, or the Chin people do. Um, so the comments, I don't have those. They all spoke them. So they all just got up and said, this is what this is meant to me. But Pastor Obeds was the one that stood out to me. Um, and he just spoke of DM2's ministry, and, and Brett in particular, in that he, he has completely changed his gospel from DM2's ministry there in his country, that he now teaches a grace gospel that, Christ died for you and was raised again, and that we believe, we trust, we depend upon that, and that is what saves us. Um, and so um, he has now changed his gospel, and then he's changed um, his ministry and his church as a result of it, and he was just overjoyed that the change in his church. He has a couple of assistant pastors I'll show you a picture of in a minute that also reiterated what he said and how Pastor Obed has changed the ministry and how they have changed their, their ministry as well which is what, what DM2 is all about. And so that's just one of those uh, amazing comments that, that I um, got to listen to. So um, this is Pastor Obed on the far left. Um, of course, Brett Nasworth in the first funky shirt. Um, and then the two, the two gentlemen there were our translators for um, the time at the church. And they're also assistant pastors there at the church. And then, of course, that's yours truly on the, the far right. Um, the first picture, they cut me out of the picture. But... So I gave you the one that I was in. But um, this was um, his church. I, and again, my pictures wouldn't upload. But the church is up on top of a hill. And I want to quickly tell you this. And it was just one of those amazing, again, one of those experiences that only can happen to me. Um, so we're going to the church that Sunday morning. Um, have no idea where I'm going. I'm just getting in a car with, with Rex. And we're following some other car. And we're just going to the church. And we pull into the cemetery. I'm like, well, gosh, I did, you know, learn about coffins, so maybe, you know, maybe I'm going to get it, put it into practice. And so we, we're driving through the cemetery, and it is an old cemetery. I mean, just one of those, I mean, for long as Zambian people have been living in Lusaka, the cat, I mean, imagine, you know, Atlanta and a cemetery in Atlanta. It was that huge and that enormous and um, just a huge cemetery. And then all of a sudden, one side of the cemetery turns into a garbage dump. And think of the biggest garbage dump you've ever seen in your life and multiply it by 100, and then you may have this garbage dump. And think of it just piled miles high. Think of flies everywhere, the worst stench you've ever smelled, a cemetery on this side, and we're driving down the middle of it. To go to a church on the hill. So, kind of like life, isn't it? Death and destruction and 
corruption and garbage and trash and where we all come from, that we are all sinners saved by grace. It was one of those, I'm just looking at Breaking Line, can you believe this? This is, this is an amazing illustration analogy. You know, I could go on with those for days. But it was just one of those things that, that t- to experience it and see all of that, and then you go and present who Jesus Christ is after you've come out of that. I mean, children walking through the garbage and picking through the garbage and eating out of the garbage, all of those things that, that you would imagine, and people living in that, in that situation. Um, and then, you know, here we go and, and, and to give the gospel in that situation. So anyway, just one of those amazing experiences uh, for, for Zambia and teaching the workshop. So what did we teach? So um, y'all know I can't leave without doing a little bit of that. So we taught Hebrews chapter 1 through 7. So if you will, turn me to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 through 7. And so maybe you find yourself in this position tonight, and you know, I, I certainly have found myself here over time, uh, a time or two, but the book of Hebrews, um, I, I kind of asked myself these questions. Um, am I tempted to give up? Are you tempted to give up? Are you prone to doubts? Am I prone to doubts? Are you drifting in your spiritual life. Is that who you are? I know none of you are like me. <laughs> Prone to doubts and drifting and who, who we are. But these believers in the book of Hebrews have begun to drift because of persecution. Because their families were upset with them. Because their friends didn't like them anymore. Because they had made a choice to believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And guess what? They were Jewish believers who had left Judaism. They had left the Mosaic system. They had left the Levitical priesthood. And they were left going and giving sacrifices at the temple. And guess what mama and daddy thought about that? And guess what mama and daddy would say to their son and their daughter? who had left Judaism. And you know what? I'm, I'm just tired of mama griping at me. I'm just tired of grandma begging me to go to, go, to, go, to ma- go to the temple with her every Sunday. You know what? If it'll make her shut up, I'll go. And the pressure and the persecution that, and their friends were making fun of them. What, you gonna go follow that Christ guy? And you know what? They became tempted to just give it all up. This is too much. This is too hard. This is too difficult. My wife, some, some husbands, right, losing their wives, losing their kids. Because you know what? You got ostracized when you left Judaism by your family, by your friends. I could get my kids back. I could do what all of these things that may be good things in and of themselves. Hey, I, I'm tempted to just give up. God, is this really what you want for me? And we get prone to doubt. Well, we're no different (laughs) than these Jewish believers. They had drifted to the formal outward religious performance. Maybe that's what was important. Bible churches are no different. We have a formal outward religious performance. And we begin to drift in our spiritual lives. Their doubts had crept into their thinking from human philosophy. Well, did God really say that? Is this really what God meant? And they had grown weary. I know none of you are weary in the spiritual life. Because sometimes it does. It gets tough. And they wanted to abandon the faith. They were ready to just say, I'm done. I'm done. But the author of Hebrews gives them some challenges and some encouragement. And he gives them some warnings. And they also apply to us today. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is my favorite. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world's who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, he upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he he himself had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
having become so much better than the angels as he has, has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This just gives you the flavor of chapter 1. In the chapter 1 and chapter 2, it is focused on the superiority of who Jesus Christ is. He is a superior revelation to the prophets of the Old Testament. He is complete revelation. Why are you wanting to go back to Moses and David when you now have the perfect revelation of Jesus Christ himself, the revealed member of the Trinity in Jesus Christ who is here before you? And you want to go back to something inferior, to the prophets. Oh, you want to go back to the angels. To which of the angels has he ever said, come sit thou at my right hand? What's better? A servant, which is what an angel is, a created being, a servant, or the son of God himself? Which is better? Hebrews, which is better for you. And so when we get tired <laughs> and when we get weary, when we're subject to drifting away from where we should be, where is our focus to be? The superiority of Jesus Christ, the heir of all things, who after he purged our sins, right after he made purification for you, on the cross, he sat down at the place of acceptance that the sacrifice had been made and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father and that's where our focus should be. Not on the pressures. Not on the people. But we consider him. The very son of God. Not the angels, not the prophets because they gave revelation in various times and in various ways as the Lord gave it to them. And it wasn't full, complete revelation. They just gave bits and pieces. Right? You can't read Zechariah, a prophet, and get the entire message of God. It was progressive. That's the only way I want you to be progressive, by the way. But progressive revelation through the Old Testament. But now in Jesus Christ, we have the full and complete revelation that Christ has stronger words than ever came through the prophets. That Christ is a greater name than the angels. He is the very Son of God himself. And that he is sure than the word of the law itself. Because the Jewish believers, what did they hearken to? Oh, the Mosaic law. That is the most important thing, and you must follow the Mosaic law, and you must do that. And, and the point of the author of Hebrews is, guess what? Jesus Christ's word to you, it is more sure than the law itself. The law had an expiration date. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law every jot and tittle. It was completely fulfilled in Christ and it expired. Why are you wanting to go back to something that had an expiration date when you have Jesus Christ who is eternal? He is the ever existing one. Why do you want to go back? Why do you want to give up and go back to something else that was lesser? Why do you want to go back to some of the ritual system that you have or that you think will help you when it is Jesus Christ that is the focus? And so that's where we go into chapter 1. In chapter 2, we get that danger of drifting. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I think Pete calls this, what, Delta 6, something like that? So here it says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. Hey, Albany Bible Church, what do you need to give earnest heed to? Jesus Christ. <laughs> you consider him. Don't drift away. COVID has made it easy for everybody to drift away. To drift. They're not centered anymore. The word of God, the, the, the focus of the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, is not their focus anymore. They're, they're focused on something else. Where is your focus? Well, it is, of course, to be on Jesus Christ. Verse 2, for if the word spoken through the angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we, how shall you, I'll do it that way, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So if every 
person that drifted received a just punishment, discipline. If you drift, do you think you're going to escape? Is that what we think? That we're going to escape the just reward? Oh, and we can be sitting in these seats and drift. Don't, don't misunderstand me. You can sit right here and drift just as easily as someone that's not here has drifted. But do we think we're just going to be okay? Because how can we neglect? Right? We know what that word means. You neglect something. You don't take care of it. It's not something that's important to you. You just leave it over to the side, and it gathers dust, and it gathers whatever, and you just neglect it. And so you're going to neglect your so great salvation that Jesus Christ gave his own life for you on the cross and was judged for your sins and gave you a, a superior, far superior system in who he is and what he has done for you than everything else, but you're just going to set that over on the shelf and neglect it. So that's our danger, of course, he gives us of drifting in chapter 1 and 2, that Christ is, is superior to all previous revelation. He is superior to the angels, and he tells us not to drift. And then he says in the next chapter, in chapter 3, that Christ is superior to Moses and the Old Testament system. And you, you see how shocking that would be to, to, um, to the Jewish believers, right? Moses is their, I mean, he is their, you know, their pinnacle of what a person should be, Abraham and Moses. And the author of this book, he says to them, he says, Moses was a servant. He was a faithful servant, and you know how faithful he was over his household. Right? Moses was so faithful when all of the children of Israel was complaining and griping and everything for him. What was he doing for them? He was interceding on their behalf. God, don't destroy him. Don't do that because your character is at stake. You led these people out of Egypt. Your character is at stake. Your faithfulness is at stake. Yes, you could do exactly what you're saying you could do, and you could still be faithful, but your reputation is on the line. Your name, your character is on the line. And Moses is interceding for these people that, in fact, want to kill him, is what Scripture says. And the Lord talks about them in Psalm 95, and and the book of Hebrews makes over 40 Old Testament uh, references, quotations, or allusions, if you will, in that, And, of course, in Numbers, it says that ten times the children of Israel tested the Lord. And the Lord. And it wasn't, you know, what we think of bad sin. It was what? It was attitude. It was grumbling and complaining and drifting away. And neglecting exactly what they had from the Lord who had parted the seas for them, from the Lord who gave them shoes that never wore out, for the Lord that fed their stomachs every day, that gave their thirst every day. But God, you're not taking care of me like I want to be taken care of. It's not what I want. And Moses interceded for them. Moses was a faithful servant, and that's how he, the author depicts him. But he says, you know what? Jesus Christ is far superior to Moses. He is the son, right? It's like me going to, you know, going and and looking at a servant. What can a servant do? A servant can give you certain things, but if you go to the son, the son can take you all over the house and let you do whatever you want to do. But a servant, oh, you can only go here. You can only go there. No, the master wouldn't want us doing that at this point. But the son comes, and what? It's free reign. Why do you want to return to an Old Testament system? Why do you want to return to that? And then he gives us this danger of doubt. What happens to us, of course, in our lives is we drift. And once we've drifted off course, or we're just drifting by, we're neglecting our great salvation. It's just, oh, oh, that's good, that's good, it's over there, I know where it is, and I'll go back to it when I want to go back to it, and I'm just going to... But what happens to us over here? Because we've drifted, we start to doubt. We're not centered on where we need to be. And we begin, to, we begin to doubt. And that is the danger for all of us, is that we begin to doubt. Does the Bible really mean what it says? Is the Lord going to be faithful to his promises? 
and you know, I asked that question. That's a very pointed question. Does the Bible really mean what it says? I mean, what does is, what is Satan say in the garden to Adam and Eve? Did the Lord really say? And that's what happens to us. We, we begin to doubt. And we believe some other philosophy, or that I can handle it my own strength and my own power. My own self-effort can accomplish it. And we forget that we are to trust, to depend every step of the way. Whatever the issue is, whatever the circumstance is, whatever the persecution is, whatever mama's saying, whatever grandmama's saying, whatever granddad's saying, we need to trust. We need to depend every moment, every step of the way. Because that's where our focus should be. And then he talks about in chapter 4 the failure of the Exodus generation. We've kind of already discussed that a little bit. And they failed to enter his rest. Now, I see this as a right here, right now rest. Not a future rest, not a loss of future rewards. I see this as failing to enter the rest right here, right now, today. What do you stand to lose if you're drifting and you're doubting? Well, you stand to lose a lot. You stand to lose peace, patience, kindness, <laughs> and goodness. What do you get? Worry. Anxiety. Over here drifting in that frustration. False expectations. And that's what happens to us. So, so when we fail to trust, when we fail to enter that rest, oh, we're going to gain a lot of stuff. But it's not going to be what you want to gain. Because what we want is to enter the rest, right? That's what we want in our lives, in our spiritual lives, is to enter the rest that he has for us, the provision he has for us, right? The children of Israel were supposed to go into the land, right? You know, in Numbers chapter 12, that's what I call the majority and the minority report. That's the 12 spies. And what happens? Ten of them say, they all see the same facts. Every one of them. Yes, everything is exactly as the Lord told us. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Man, there's prosperity everywhere. That's the ten tribes, right? Both Joshua and Caleb say the same thing. But the ten say what? There are giants in the land. There are problems in the land. There are obstacles in the land. We can't do this. Now, they forgot about parting of the Red Sea and the Lord destroying the largest army in the world, the Egyptians, and how he had taken care of them every day since then through the mediator Moses. Have you forgotten how the Lord has brought you where you are today? Are you grumbling, complaining, drifting, and doubting? Forgetting the Lord's provision for you. Just a little application for you to answer to yourself. Because that's what the children of Israel did. But there were two. There were Joshua and Caleb and said, yes, there are giants in the land. It's exactly the same fact. Everybody saw the same facts. They just had a different interpretation of the facts. Two chose to trust. And ten said, no, can't do it. And that's when the Lord said, no more. You will receive your discipline, children. As you're all believers, you're going to receive your discipline, and that is you will die in the land. You will not enter rest. Joshua and Caleb, you will enter rest in your lifetime. In your lifetime. And that second generation you're worried about is going to die out here, and oh, they're going to get killed by all the giants. They're going to go into the land. They're going to have rest. But not you who drifted, doubted, grumbled, complained. And those serve as an example. Paul even tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that those serve as an example for us. A bad example, right? I always like those bad examples. My brother, great bad example for me. I know I don't want to do that, right? That's the children of Israel. They're the bad example. I don't want to do that. I watch what happens when my brother does that. So you know what? I don't want that to happen to me. And that's the idea with Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says these are a, a, an example for us not to do what they did. And they all died in the desert in discipline. So Albany Bible Church, I want you to finish well. 
right? A- as we're living this life, we need to enter the rest that he has provided for us in the spiritual life, which is a daily trust, a daily dependence upon him. And so we see that Christ is a more faithful servant than Moses. In fact, Moses served as a mediator, and angel served as a mediator for the Mosaic Covenant. But Christ is now the one mediator between God and man, a far superior mediator. What do we need a mediator for? When we've got a problem, right? That's what lawyers do. We mediate between the one who has the problem and the, and the court. And that's what Christ does for us, because we have a problem with God the Father. And we have a far superior mediator than the old covenant. We have the mediator in Jesus Christ. So why do you want to go back to an old covenant with an old mediator when you have a live mediator who is now serving as your gracious high priest? And so what is he doing for you? He's ever interceding for you at the right hand of the Father. Yeah, he knows what I need. He knows what provision I need. He knows how to take care of me. He knows what is best for me. But I want to drift and I want to doubt and I want to neglect what he's given me. Because I can do it my own way. I can figure this out. I got this. And so we drift and we doubt. That becomes the second warning. He challenges us with the Exodus generation and we're to challenge to enter God's rest through trust. And then he finally tells us in chapter 7 that Jesus is our high priest. The high priest of Jesus Christ is superior than Aaron's priesthood. Aaron was the Levitical priesthood. He was the first high priest. And Christ's priesthood is far superior. Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. He is the king priest. He is an eternal high priest, ever interceding for you and for me. We don't have to go to the Levites anymore. And so Hebrew, Jewish believers, why do you want to go back to the temple to a Levitical priesthood who didn't die for your sins, who didn't serve as the perfect mediator between God and man, who is an imperfect human just like you are, but you want to go back to that rather than to go to whom? The perfect high priest who was the, not only the priest, making the sacrifice for your sin, but he was the sacrifice itself. So he was the priest and the sacrifice all in one. But you want to go back to some animal system, the blood of bulls and goats. Now, I know you're all thankful we didn't have to bring a chicken tonight or a bull and a goat to sacrifice. Because we've had one sacrifice once for all. And that's who Jesus Christ is. And so in this, he challenges us to move to maturity. Challenges us to stop taking the bottle. Stop changing diapers. And he challenges us to move to maturity. Where are you? Are you drifting and doubting and in need of the basics of the Christian life again? because you've been drifting and doubting and neglecting something that's so important? Or are we ready to move to maturity? A lot of folks just like to, as the saying goes, sit, soak, and sour. Is that you? Or is this something else? Are we ready to move on to maturity? And he, of course, challenges us that Jesus' high priest is better than Aaron's high priest ever has been. And so we see that we are in danger of dullness here. That not only do we drift, and then we come into doubt, and then we become dull of hearing. I don't want to hear Pete anymore. I'm done with that. Sorry, just illustration. No one would ever say that, Mr. Pete. I don't want to listen to that loud mouth up there tonight. I don't want to listen anymore. It hasn't helped me. How does, how does that help my spiritual life today? I know you've heard it because you've probably thought it in your mind. 
I'm like, I'm, I know who you are because I'm one of you. I know what goes on up there. And we start becoming dull of hearing when we just turn it off. And then we get into the other warnings, which we didn't teach. But there's two more. But I wanted you to give you a flavor of what we taught in Zambia. And we teach it verse by verse there, a lot slower. And I'm not as much of trying to be a comedian. I understand that. But it's verse by verse as we go through it. And I just kind of gave you the highlights of what we taught there. Is that Christ is superior. Why do you want some other religious system? Whether it's Catholicism or whatever it may be. Some outward religious ritual or performance that you think you have to keep up with. Because Christ is the fulfillment of all that. He is the only fulfillment that's needed. He's the one that Christ was satisfied, I mean, God was satisfied with. And so he sat down at the right hand. Right? I asked one guy, I asked him, he stood up. It was, it was the most beautiful illustration I'd ever given in my life, and I didn't even plan it, and it just happened, and it was great. Those are the best, right? Because I didn't even know I'd be doing it. And I told him, he got up, and he read the scripture for me, and he read the scripture, and boy, he, he just did a great job of it, and he just read the scripture, and then he sat down. And it just, I said, hey, why did you just sit down? He said, the work was completed. The work of reading the scripture that you asked me to do, I was done, so I sat. Why is Christ seated at the right hand of God the Father? The work for your salvation is done. Right? There, there's nothing for you to do. There's no work you can do. There's no work you could ever do to match the work of Christ. And so that's why we just get to trust. <laughs> I trust in his work. That he is the one that died for me in my place. That he took my penalty and he was raised again. That's the gospel. I just believe that and trust that. Thankfully, there's no work for me to do because you know what? I couldn't do it. I couldn't build a coffin. Not even my own. I would never be able to do enough good work. How would I know if I ever did enough? Where's that scripture? Oh, I just do more than Paige does. It picked on you a lot tonight. Sorry. Love you, sister. How would you ever know that you did enough? But you don't have to. Because there's one man that did all the work. The God man, Jesus Christ. He did all the work for you and for me. I don't have to pay anything. He paid the whole price. Nothing left for me to pay. And it's all done because of the work of Jesus Christ. And that's what I get to trust in. And of course, the spiritual life is no different. The same faith I have when I believe that he died for me and was raised again is the same faith I have in his word and his promises. And I'm to trust that. Same faith. And I trust. So when you start doubting, drifting, neglecting, and turn Mr. Pete off, think about who you are. And then remind yourself who you're to be focused on. Hebrews will go on to tell you to consider him. Consider him. When you start all that stuff in your head, stop and you consider him. Fixing your eyes upon the author and perfecter of your faith. The author. He's the one that originated and he's the one that completed it. He brought it to an end. Why are you going to look somewhere else? Why are you going to go back to an old system? Why are you going to do something that, that you think you can do on your own? He is it. There's nothing else. So you consider him. You fix your eyes on him. Right? And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.
Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for who you are um, and what you have done for us, that you have given us uh, the perfect solution in Jesus Christ. Father, that it wasn't it wasn't just by chance, it was a perfect plan that you made, that you gave us Jesus Christ, you publicly crucified him for the world to see. That there would be no doubt about what happened to him, that he died for us. And that he died for our sins and that he was raised again, showing the power over sin and the power over death would not defeat him. And so, Father, we thank you for who he is. We thank you that you have given us the opportunity to have ministries outside of the church and outside of, of other places. And we thank you that you give us the opportunity to give the gospel and teach the word to those who need it. Father, may we be your instruments as we leave um, this place tonight and all that we do. And, Father, remind us to trust, to consider him who has done so much for us. In Christ's name, amen. So the last slide I have, I think, is questions. So I have